All right, welcome back. Today we're going to continue our walk through unit five of the uh, revolutions uh, unit of AP World Modern with a discussion of 5.6 and 7, uh, government's uh, role in industrialization and the economic developments that continue to spur this industrial revolution. Uh, what you need to know is that as the influence of the Industrial Revolution grows, a number of states and governments around the world are going to promote their own state-sponsored visions of industrialization to varying degrees of success. And the expansion of the United States and European influence in Asia is going to lead to internal reform in Asia that supports industrialization and leads to the growing regional power of Japan during what is known as the Meiji era. Now we're going to start, we're going to do a run through uh, a number of countries that the College Board loves to ask questions about or have you guys write a little bit about in terms of their responses to industrialization. Um, first, the Qing Dynasty in China. Now, China has long been the world's dominant manufacturing center, but this changed with the Industrial Revolution as we're going to see Western Europe, Britain, United States rise in their percentage of global manufacturing, while places like China um, are going to decline in terms of their global share. Um, and now we see the Qing Dynasty lagging behind Western European states. Uh, in the 19th century, China is going to experience domination by Britain uh, through the opium wars of the mid-19th century that demonstrate the weakness of, of the Qing state. And internal rebellions like the Taiping Rebellion will further contribute to this state weakness. We'll talk more about that in a later, later video. Um, attempts at reform from the Qing Dynasty come through what's called the self-strengthening movement, which is going to feature a move towards modernization and industrial industrialization, but still based on Chinese traditions that will ultimately prove too little too late to resist the now growing powers of not only Western Europe, but also Japan right next door. The Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire has long been one of the most powerful empires in the world. In fact, it's the longest lasting empire that we cover in AP world, growing in the, in the 1300s and lasting all the way until the early 20th century. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to industrialization and modernization in the Ottoman Empire from powerful bureaucrats and warrior elites who see their wealth and their power connected to traditional uh, roles in agriculture in, um, in the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Ottoman Empire, like China, is going to become heavily influenced by Western powers, particularly Great Britain. Um, they're also going to experience ethnic nationalism and popular unrest that leaves the Ottoman Empire weaker in the face of Western powers. Some uh, in the West are going to refer to the Ottoman Empire as the sick man of Europe. Uh, Ottoman Empire will make some attempts at modernizing its political and economic systems through what are known as the Tanzimat reforms. Um, but ultimately, these fail to maintain unity and strength within the empire. And the empire will start to fraction with, um, with regions like Egypt and Greece and Serbia uh, gaining their independence through the 19th century. In Egypt, a new leader named Muhammad Ali will push to industrialize Egypt himself uh, through the development of a modern home-based cotton textile industry. Japan. Now, Japan is like the real success story of this move towards uh, uh, industrialization. Um, following the arrival of American warships led by Commodore Matthew Perry in 1853 in, in Tokyo Harbor, Japan will be forced to sign some unequal treaties, much like China had to do after the Opium Wars, in order to avoid greater conflict. But upper level China, Japanese bureaucrats uh, frustrated with this, this bowing down to American military power will push for reforms to avoid the same kind of Western domination that China was experiencing. This results in what is known as the Meiji Restoration, the, the rise, the end of the shogunate and the rise to prominence of the Japanese emperor again, um, an emperor who now supports industrialization and modernization built on Western models. And Japan will look around the world World and import experts uh, from, from Britain and Germany, um, and they'll look to the United States um, to, to craft a modern westernized 
Asian state. And they're going to be very successful at doing this. By 1900, Japan will be the most industrialized Asian nation. And they've even begun to create an empire uh, with the defeat of China in the Sino-Japanese War uh, that began in 1894. Now, Russia is another country that had been lagging behind Western Europe and has long looked at itself in the shadows of Western European developments. Remember, Peter the Great, his, his great push was to westernize uh, Russia. Um, and this is going to continue in the 19th century, where the, the czarist government in Russia will move to modernize and industrialize the Russian state. Um, in 1861, the serfs will be emancipated in part to provide an industrial workforce uh, for growing Russian cities. Um, the Russian government will sponsor construction of, of vast infrastructure projects like the Trans-Siberian Railroad. There it is. There, there it is. Like the Trans-Siberian Railroad that will link the entire empire from, from east to west and provide easier access to resources found in the east that will be a boom in steel production for the Russian state. And, and Russia, because it lacks that investment capital that, that England had, for example, will seek foreign investments through their finance minister, a man named Sergei Vita, um, as Russians lacked that capital for their own development. Now we want to look at some of the uh, economic systems that were, uh, will develop during this industrial age that helps Western Europe grow into this dominant industrial and economic force. We see a move from mercantilism uh, to free market capitalism. Uh, we see the global nature of trade and production contributing to the growth of what we call transnational businesses that rely on new uh, types of banking and finance practices. And finally, the development of industrial capitalism is going to increase the standard of living of some uh, in Western Europe and around the world as consumer goods become more readily available. So let's talk about this rise of capitalism. Um, we talked in our earlier period, 1450 to 1750, about the mercantilist economy. This was an economic idea that said that the wealth of the world was very limited. So it encouraged colonial uh, colony building and it encouraged governments to support their own local industries through things like uh, tariffs against uh, foreign goods. The capitalist model based on the theories of Adam Smith called for laissez-faire economics, hands off, leave it alone, get the government out of, the, out of, out of economic um, uh, dealings, um, and free trade policies. Let nations trade with each other if that's what works out best for them. Uh, these policies are going to spur economic growth in Western Europe and the development of new business organizations. We see joint stock companies that had begun in the earlier period grow tremendously during this 19th century. Uh, we see um, uh, the growth of stock markets, uh, places where, where shares of these joint stock companies can be bought and sold very easily. The birth of the Limited Liability Corporation, an LLC, um, that spreads risk among many investors while offering the ability to raise capital investments for growth. This in turn is going to create a growth of an investment class of people, this new uh, urban middle class who is going to see its wealth and its political power start to eclipse that of the traditional landed aristocracy. Um, through processes like horizontal consolidation, this is when a, a company will, will buy out its competitors, and vertical integration, where a company will try to control all aspects of its production. Think of a, a steel company, a company that produces steel, wanting to own not only uh, the steel mills, but also the railroads and the iron mines, uh, where that steel will ultimately be produced out of. This will lead to the development of monopolies in the 19th century, where one industry takes complete control over, uh, uh, or one company takes complete control over a, uh, an industry or a market. Um, and this is going to lead some to becoming incredibly wealthy, while others end up having to pay far more for their products. Uh, we also see during this era uh, the rise of insurance houses like Lloyd's of London that, that ensure valuable cargo going across long distances, uh, even oceans, that will further limit risk to investors. And when there's less risk, more people are willing to invest more in these companies. 
new transportation and communication technologies, think railroads and steamships and telegraphs, will lead to the development of transnational corporations that operate across many nations in the world. A couple examples to be familiar with, uh, HSBC, this is still today one of the world's biggest banks, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. It's a British bank uh, that operates in, uh, in China and focuses on global banking and investments uh, in East Asia. Um, in the Western Hemisphere, we have the United Fruit Company. These are the Chiquita Banana people uh, of today. This is an American company with operations throughout Latin America. Uh, this is also where we get the term Banana Republic uh, that you might have heard before, not the, the store where you can for some reason buy a $50 t-shirt, uh, but a, a banana republic, one of these Latin American governments that are strongly influenced by the American United Fruit Company um, uh, to shape government policies towards the needs and the desires of this company, often seen as, as, as corrupt. Um, and then the Unilever Corporation. This is a Dutch and British conglomeration that produces soaps and personal care items um, in uh, places like uh, Africa and Latin America. Um, and um, will oft, often have, um, um, like the United Fruit Company, a lot of influence over local governments in those regions. This time period also sees the birth of consumerism with increased standards of living for some Westerners, certainly not all, we'll talk about that in our next session. Uh, consumption of consumer goods uh, will increase, uh, leading to the rise of a consumer culture as consumer goods become more available and more affordable. Uh, we also see at the same time the development of an advertising industry that supports these newly available consumer goods, trying to convince us that we need even more than we are have. For the middle and upper classes, leisure time, uh, free time in your day will be now available like it had never been before that's going to offer more people more opportunities for consumerism. Uh, things like bicycles are invented and grow in popularity. Uh, popular sports like soccer and baseball, tennis and golf will develop and grow, um, especially in popularity amongst uh, these new middle and upper class people. Big three that you want to take out of this session. Governments are going to take new roles in working to industrialize their nations, to compete with Western powers, to varying degrees of success. The most successful in East Asia is going to be Japan following the Meiji Restoration. And we see a move from the mercantilist economic system of 1450 to 1750 to a capitalist economy that fuels the economic success of Western European states and spurs a consumer culture uh, among middle and aristocratic classes. We'll talk to you next time.